Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. Hope you're having a great day. I've had a hectic morning. I suppose that's what happens when there's a virus going around. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about equity realization because I get questions about this all the time with people out, with, without people even really knowing what they're asking for, what they're asking about. But we'll be discussing that in just a second. Before we do get started though, I'm giving away $1,500 in cash because you know, Guess I don't need 1500 extra dollars in my life. You can enter that giveaway at pokercoaching.com slash giveaway. Right now, we're giving away $500 to the winner and then 10 $100 bills to the other people. It's just straight cash, you know, because I realize a lot of people are hurting right now and I'm happy to do my best to lend a helping hand. So check that out at pokercoaching.com slash giveaway. Also, we're having a big sale right now for poker coaching and poker coaching premium memberships at pokercoaching.com slash lucky. I sent an email out yesterday to some of my students and fans and just asking like, how are things going? And I got a wide range of responses. Some people are fine as if nothing's happening in the world. Other people are um, saying it's rough. And to be fair, I, I realize it's rough for a lot of people. And that is, that is a very tough thing. We live in a very tough time at the moment. And like, if you're in a business that faces consumers in the physical world, you're probably hurting, and um, I realize that's tough. Realize, uh, try to figure out skills that you have that no one else has, and then figure out a way to use those skills to help people in this time of need. And I realize that a lot of people don't have skills, they've not developed those, but if anything, use this as a time to better your skills, learn something new. Um, Things that you could learn are how to play poker. You could learn a new language. You could learn learn various skills online, right? Lots of colleges out there, including many of the best in the world, have completely free classes where you can go learn things like engineering and computer science and programming and whatnot. And anytime you're like forced to not work, essentially make sure you don't squander that time because view it as an opportunity as opposed to a detrimental thing. I realize if you can't pay bills, it's a very bad thing. But all you can do is make the most of the hand you've been dealt. And I realize some of you have been dealt some pretty bad cards right now. How do you keep up motivation in the current situation? It's tough, actually. Like, a lot of stuff doesn't get me down, but this is actually kind of getting me down a little bit. How do I keep up motivation? Well, at the moment, I'm just um, persisting. I'm doing my best to hang out, hang around, and do good work. Um, my wife and I are, are both at home. I'm not going to play poker. She's not going to work. And uh, our nanny's not here, so we're taking care of the kids. And yesterday, I didn't get anything done. Today, she's probably not going to get anything done. And it's tough. It's tough. How do, you make, how do you keep up motivation? I don't know. Realize that we will all get through this. And if you work for the next few months while other people don't work for the next few months, well, you're going to be ahead of them, right? When I say work, I mean study and learn things, right? You hear the boys. You hear James. Yes. All right, so today let's talk about equity realization. I got an email from someone that said 10-4 suited is 1% better than 9-8 suited. But 9-8 suited is thought to be a better hand. Why is this? Well, first things first, I, I don't even know if 10-4 uh, suited is in any world better than 9-8 uh, suited. Let's just pull up Equilab real quick and see. I actually don't even know what it's going to say here because it doesn't matter, but let's see. 10-4 suited versus 9-8 Nine eight suited. If we just straight ran these against each other, not that that's how you should look at these scenarios, but you do see right here, ten four suited actually wins uh, fifty four percent of the time against nine eight suited. So that must mean it's better. Mm, no, not so much. That's not exactly how poker works. Let's take um, nine eight suited against a reasonable range. Going over here in Equilab and inputting a reasonable range. You know, it could be any reasonable range. It doesn't even matter which one we're talking about specifically. I can be pretty sure that 9-8 suited is going to fare decently well against a reasonable range. Uh, let's just do this one. 9-8 suited has 39% equity. Let's see how much 10-4 suited has. 10-4 suited has 35% equity. So you see, running those hands against each other, you see that 10-4 suited is quote unquote better, but you're not running 10-4 suited against 9-8 suited all the time, right? So realize 
that there's this idea of equity realization, which essentially means how well does the hand play post-flop? When people say this hand plays better than other hands post-flop, they mean that it makes hands that are usually pretty easy to get to the showdown and also hands that are very often to make the best hand. Those things kind of go hand in hand. And this is why it's important that you don't play hands like big card with a little card because hands with a big card and a little card aren't particularly great. Oh, what happened to Lando? He got knocked over. There you go. Sit, Lando, sit. Um, so you want to essentially be asking that question very frequently. How well does my hand realize its equity? Sometimes it'll realize it poorly, sometimes it won't. Fortunately for all of you, there's actually a program that will show you this. It's called Power Equilab. Um, PyoSolver does this as well, as far as I know. So does Munker Solver. All the solvers do this. But let's take a look at this image I have pulled up. Let's consider a hypothetical scenario, okay? Cut off min raises off of a short stack, a 13 big blind stack, okay? And we are playing a tournament and we're in the big blind. What are our pot odds? First things first, we need to realize 18% equity. I know, um, I mean, I've been guilty of saying this sometimes because it just flows off the tongue, but you need to win 18% of the time based on your pot odds. That's not exactly true. You actually need to realize 18% equity. Okay, so we need to realize 18% equity based on our pot odds because we're putting in one big blind to win a 5.5 big blind pot. One divided by 5.5 is 18%, okay? So now let's say we have a hand like 7.5 offsuit, okay? Well, our raw equity right here is 34%. How do we know that? You take, um, let's say let's say the initial raise was raising 33% of hands, which I presumed here. We do 33%. We run a 7.5 offsuit. You see that wins 33% of the time, right? It's off the screen, okay. Wins 33% of the time. All right, so now what we do is we take our equity that we need, 18%, and divide it by our raw equity. 18% divided by 34% is 50-ish percent, right? So now you can actually go over here and look at this chart that Power Equilab will develop for you and find 7.5 offsuit. And you see it actually has 73% right here. It's gonna realize 73% of its equity. I don't know if you can see that, it's a little bit blurry. If you're on Instagram, sorry, watch on YouTube, youtube.com slash poker coaching. And, um, Basically, this is a scenario where when cutoff min raises with 33% of hands and we are in the big blind, we get to call with all of these hands in this chart that have more than 50-ish percent equity realization, which if you look at this chart, it's actually almost, well, it is everything. It's kind of crazy to think about, right? You can actually defend from the big blind against the min raise with either 100% or very close to 100% of your range. And that's something that a lot of people do not recognize. They don't realize that when we're playing shallow stack, we actually realize our equity kind of well. As you start playing deeper stack though, you're gonna start realizing your equity worse. And when you're shallow, you actually get to defend your big blind a lot. When you are not shallow, you need to be a little bit tighter. And that's very important to recognize. So some general tips for equity realization. You are going to over-realize your equity, as we saw with my, my image here, with your best hands, like we see here, Pocket Aces realizes 218% of its equity. It actually crushes the opponents. And that's because your opponents are gonna make stuff like top pair that they're gonna think is good and they're not gonna fold it, right? That's usually gonna be the case. The best hands always over-realize their equity. Like even Ace-9 suited over-realizes its equity. Ace-Queen offsuit over-realizes, right? So the best hands are over-realizing in this scenario. This, this changes based on the scenario you're in, by the way. It's not, not the same every time. Um, so the best hands will over-realize their equity. Being in position, you will often over-realize your equity because you're going to raise, your opponent's going to call, they're going to check the flop, you're going to bet, and they're going to fold when they don't connect so well, right? So that's going to result in them folding, which means you're over-realizing your equity. So in position, you will over-realize your equity, and with your strongest hands, you will over-realize your equity. And the hands that flop decently well tend to realize their equity pretty well too. Um, like let's take 9-8 suited, right? 9-8 suited realizes 96% of its equity, which is a lot, right? 
Jack Tensu to realize is 110 percent of its equity, percent of its equity. So uh, compare that to 104 suited. Where's 104 suited? 104 suited realizes 84 uh, percent of its equity, which is less than 98 percent, right? Which is why 98 suited is just a straight up better hand. Where can you find this document? This is this is not a document. This is just a chart made with Power Equilab. You have to pay for that program, but there it is. So uh, there are a few other ideas here. As you are shallower stacked, you will realize more of your equity. Don't forget this. This is very, very important. What happens to a lot of people is they think when they get shallow stacked, their only options are all in or fold. And this has been proliferated by the idea that I need to use an all in or fold chart whenever I'm shallow stacked. But that is absolutely incorrect, especially from the big blind you are and the small blind. You are allowed to call slash limp, right? And if you do not do that, you are giving away a substantial amount of money. Same thing with reshove charts. Uh, recently, there was a push fold app out there that decided to put out reshove charts. And everyone who's following them is lighting their money on fire. If you are blindly following reshove charts and never flat calling, or rarely flat calling, you're making a big, 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 big mistake. To the point that you're only going to win if your opponents are pretty bad. All right. What is the topic today? So the topic today is equity realization. Great week of content. We did the God's Big Toe Hand History Review, online poker chat with Mac Verstandig. I'm actually interviewing um, Brian Koppelman, the co-writer of Rounders, the guy in charge of the show Billions. I'm gonna, we're going to have an interview today for that. We're doing a little coffee. We're, we're doing it, right? We are doing it. We do our best to stay active and busy and, and useful for all of you. So the idea of equity realization also applies to some extent uh, with hands post-flop, right? Like say middle position raises, you call from the big blind with king five suited, it comes jack six two. If you check and they bet, it's probably okay to just fold when you're pretty deep stacked. Whereas if you have one big blind left, it's not okay to fold, right? Because say you're playing 40 big blinds deep or 80 big blinds deep, if you check call the flop, they're just gonna keep betting the turn and you're gonna lose a lot of the time, right? Whereas if you have one big blind left, you're just always getting the right pot odds to call. So this idea of equity realization also applies um, post-flop, right? Don't think that it only applies pre-flop because it makes sense, right? As your hand plays worse and worse, you should be quicker to ditch it. I actually did a hand history review with Michael Acevedo where he reviewed some of my hands recently. And one of the things he said that I do perhaps too much is that I will fold hands that realize their equity poorly, perhaps a tiny bit too early. A good example of this is say someone raises, you call ace-x offsuit in the big blind, flop comes anything, anything that's not super connected. Um, that, that's a scenario where like, if you don't have a pair, it's still probably okay to check call at small bets. But if your opponent's gonna be barreling you a lot, which a lot of good aggressive people will, it actually becomes kind of okay to fold it because you realize like what can go wrong here where your opponent can keep barreling you. And when you continue to get barreled, you have to fold a ton, right? And this, this idea definitely does apply. And to be fair, I'm sure Michael was right. He's running it through the solver and solver says it's like a reluctant call with stuff like ace high on you know, nine, eight, three when you have ace four, but it is what it is. All right, let's see. In the first example, does nine, eight suited realize more equity than 10, four suited? Yes, nine, eight suited realizes 96, 10, four suited realizes 80, 82. So over here, 10, four suited realizes 82%. 9-8 suited realizes 96%. And as you get uh, deeper, you're going to find that the hands that don't realize their equity great are going to realize it like even worse. And the hands that realize their equity well are going to generally continue retaining their equity. What if you're playing the bottom 20% of hands against nits and try to hit something like two pair and open into straight draw? What if? I just told you're supposed to defend 100% of hands or very close to it. So um, what if you hit two pair? What do you mean? You put your money in if you have no chips. I do think it is a mistake, though, when you're deep stacked to call with stuff trying to get two pair, because whenever you get two pair, unless your opponents are really bad, like, for example, let's say under the gun makes it three big blinds, six people call, and you're in the big blind with seven-two offsuit. Should we call here for two big blinds more into, what, a 18-big blind pot? Well, the answer is probably still no. And the reason it's no 
is because when you do make two pair and you check raise six ways or seven ways, it's just like obvious you have a really good hand. So your opponents, if they're competent, probably shouldn't be paying you off all that often, right? So you're not gonna realize your implied odds. Next, you could easily be beat. Say it does come eight, seven, two. You're like, all right, I got the nuts. But eight, seven's always in there. Eight, seven suited for your opponents is always in there. Same thing with pocket eights and sevens and twos. Obviously there aren't a ton of combinations, but when you're against a bunch of players, you will run into it sometimes and then you're just crushed because you're dead or nearly dead. So um, that's why I don't want to be playing hands like that. Like king five offsuit's an easy fold. As it gets more and more multi-way, the hands that realize their equity poorly, heads up, realize their equity even worse because um, you're again, you're more likely to be dominated. Do you think micro turbo sit and goes can be profitable? Any game can be profitable if your opponents are bad enough. 15 minutes in a tournament. I don't know what you're saying, Dino. All right. Someone asked they could ask a question. You can always ask questions. I may or may not answer it. I lost it. Well, that's what happens when I get to talking. When I'm in the middle of a long spiel and you type a question, chances are it'll get lost. All right, all right, all right. Feel free to repost it. But yes, you can be profitable in any game, and micro stakes sit and goes are profitable. The problem is, is that you can't really play them at high stakes, so I would suggest you spend your time doing other things. How do you build a bankroll online? I would tell you to play smallish stakes cash games. The problem with this idea is it kind of presumes you don't have any money, which kind of presumes you're not very good at poker. If you're not very good at poker and you don't have any money, I would definitely not suggest you try to start playing poker full time, right? Because you are presumably not great at poker based on past results or the fact that you don't have a ton of money and the fact that you're asking the question to begin with, right? Also, it depends on what works with your life. Say you have a job and you work nine to five, six days a week. Well, tournaments probably aren't going to work for you, right? Because you need all day for tournaments. If you're in the big blind with a short stack, seven five big wait. If you're in the big blind short with seven five offsuit and a deep stack from middle position raises, that's a tough call. No, it's an easy call. I just I just showed you it's an easy call. Are you saying to call sometimes or are you missing it? No, it's an easy call. Definitely defend against a min raise. Remember, this question was against a min raise, so you need to realize 18% equity, right? If you um let's say you need to realize more equity, the calculation would be different. Let's get out the calculator. Say you needed to realize like 25% equity because they raise bigger. It'd be 25 divided by, uh, what was the number? By our 34% equity. So now we, we need to defend with all the charts that have more than 73% equity on the chart. This is how you use this, by the way. And we see now 7.5 offsuit is right at 73% equity. So as your opponent raises bigger, you should be defending less often. But against the min raise, you actually should defend incredibly wide, which is something people do wrong. And you say it's a tough call. It's a tough call only because you've not studied the math. And you have to realize, whenever you're playing 13 big blinds deep, you flop a pair you, or a straight draw, you put your money in. And if you don't, you check fold, right? It's not, it's not rocket science when you're playing 13 big blinds deep. Ten seven suited, nine eight suited. They're all basically the same hand. Uh, well, let's look right here. Ten eight, ten seven suited has ninety percent equity in the scenario. Nine eight suited has ninety six percent equity. So uh, they probably realize roughly the same amount of equity, or they probably have the same amount of equity. So let's see. Ten seven suited. Let's just pretend we're running it in this spot. Thirty seven percent versus thirty eight percent. So nine eight suited is actually better. So the statement here is just very wrong, at least in this exact scenario I'm looking at. We just ran this, right? We looked at this exact spot. 9-8 suited does better than 10-7 suited by a little bit. So make sure you're running various scenarios. Talk about jacks. How should you play it? Appropriately. Figure out if it's a premium made hand, draw a marginal made hand, or junk. Do you jam king, queen, offsuit under the gun for 20 big blinds already in the money? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Don't open jam 20 big blinds from early position. It's just a big mistake. You're way better off min raising and then playing appropriately depending on how your opponents react. You wanted to hear my opinion on using shark scope to identify players? Yeah, sure. Like why not, right? It's it's not necessarily clean, good information, but it's information. Like say you're playing against someone who's just down 450K playing $200 buy-in tournaments, they're bad, right? Whereas um, if you're up playing against somebody who's won $10 million playing $200 buy-in tournaments, they're good. So 
figure that out. Also, you'll see some people who have like two big caches over the course of five years, they're probably not nearly as good as someone who has a lot of consistent caches, right? It's information, right? Is information valuable? Is it worth the time you have to put in to get it? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Is this chart free? No, this is a one out of many, many charts you can generate with Power Equal App. This is only for a very specific situation. This is for when cutoff raises 13 big blinds deep, we call big blind facing a min raise. That's all this chart's for. This is not for when under the gun raises. This is not for when middle position raises. It's for when the cutoff raises or with anyone raises with 33% of hands. That's exactly what this chart is for. Um, it's only for 13 big blinds deep, right? It's not for 100 big blinds deep. The numbers would be way lower for the hands that realize equity poorly. Should you jam ace king under the gun 20 big blinds? No, you should not. It's a big mistake. How do I feel about Poker Snow? I think it's a nice solid program. Probably teach you to be a little bit too tight, but that's okay. What factors? What are the factors for a good equity realization? Position, yes. Number of players, yes. Um, stack depth, right? You typically realize equity better when you're shallow stack because you just get any any decent flop, you're all in, right? Um, what else did I write here? We said position already, yeah. And then like hand strength, right? The hands, big card, little cards, realize equity really poorly. As we can see over here, look, like, let's just go right over here. We see um, King 4 Offsuit realizes 65% equity, which is like worse than 7-5 suited, right? So in theory, you should be defending 7-5 suited in this spot before you should be defending, I'm sorry, 7-5 Offsuit before you should be defending King 4 Offsuit. That said, King 4 Offsuit is probably gonna have a little bit more equity. Let's see, King 4 Offsuit has 38% equity. Whereas 7-5 offsuit has 33, right? So the equation becomes uh, 38 divided by 38 divided by 18. I'm sorry, 18 divided by 38. My brain's not working this morning. Was it 38? No, my brain's, okay. We need 18 divided by 38. Is that what I just did? Yeah, 18 divided by 38 is 47%. And um, does this have more than 47%? Yes, yes, it does. So anyway, my brain's fried this morning, everyone. This is what happens when you don't sleep. I was up until like 2 a.m. this morning. Um, where are we going over here? 102 viewers, only 29 likes. Come on. Yeah, well, people don't enjoy talking about poker, it seems. Maybe they'll learn to click the like button. We'll see. Maybe one day. All right, let's see. Your wife got you poker coaching premium for your birthday. Well, happy birthday. Congrats, Evan. The team has been very helpful. Well, that's that's the goal. We have a support team. Believe it or not, it's not just me answering all the support emails. Uh, we any, For anything pertaining to billing, finances, locating topics, or lo locating specific content, et cetera, et cetera, um, I have someone who helps with that. Is folding king queen better than a min raise? Probably not. Does pot control mean equity realization? Um, not exactly, because let's say under the gun raises, you call big blind, flop comes ace, king, three, they, you check, they should bet every time. So it's not, um, it's not, uh, like betting lets you realize your equity with all of your junky hands. Are you, are you all like asking what should we be raising with preflop? Go to pokercoaching.com, go to the tool section, we have implementable GTO charts right there for you. Please go there and get that. It's right there, completely available for you at pokercoaching.com slash, we'll go to pokercoaching.com and sign up. 15 minute blinds, 42 person tournament. And we get 1200 chips and one rebuy, also 1200 chips, short stack and shallow. Please, it's a simple question. What's the question? There's no question mark in this. If you type something and there's no question mark, it's not a question, it's a statement. And like, I don't need to reply to statements. Here's a question. Is the World Series of Poker going to happen? Actually, it says WSOP going to happen. I can re I can figure that one out and realize what that means. Is there any way of it, is there any way it happening or moving events online? See, look, like that's not even a very good, well, well written sentence, but I can figure it out, right? Because there's question marks in there. Um, is the World Series going to happen in some shape or form? Probably. At the same time, the normal time, probably not. Um, will they move some events online? Maybe. It's gonna be bad though. I mean, like the idea is we're gonna to go to New Jersey or Nevada to play an event to win a bracelet. I mean, like, no, we're not really doing this, right? I mean, I'm not gonna go. I'll be sitting in New York City. I'm not gonna go 
is it across a bridge or through a tunnel? I think either way. I'm not going to go through either of them to play an online event in New Jersey. It's just not going to happen. So it's not going to happen for me unless Vegas is somehow clean by whenever they run it. They may end up taking a year off. Maybe they'll make the World Series Europe much bigger. That might be a play if they do that in the, um, in the, later, in the fall or whatever. Oh, you're asking, is this, what is this question? Is it too shallow? I don't know what the blinds start at. You, Dino, come on, man. You've literally listed no information. You didn't ask the question to begin with. Also, you did not tell me what the blind structure is. Also, also, what does too shallow mean? Nothing's too shallow. I mean, you can play any tournament, right? Question is, how much is the rake? Are the opponents good or bad, right? Imagine you're playing against players who are really bad and they just fold literally every single hand besides aces. And with aces, they go all in. Well, you can beat 90% rake, right? Because your opponents are terrible. Um, so your opponents go all in blind every hand. Probably can't beat 90% rake, but you can probably beat 30% rake, right? Even with a, a bad structure. So you're starting at 10-20. You're starting with 60 big blinds. No, you can beat the game. Maybe not for a lot. Do you think the world will end in 2020? Um, does that mean, do I think humans will be eradicated in 2020? No, probably not. Almost certainly not. I'm just going to help everyone out here. If you want to ask me a question, please make sure there's a question mark in your statement. What is your strategy in a knockout tournament? Try to knock people out. <laughs> if you're playing at a limping table, should you call the button with anything? Absolutely not. This goes back to what we were talking about, right? These hands like 7-3 offsuit doesn't realize its equity very well, so absolutely not. How do you go about learning GTO? Go to pokercoaching.com slash premium, sign up, Go to Michael Acevedo's webinars and start going through them. Alternatively, I have a book that I helped Michael write called Modern Poker Theory. This is the definitive guide on GTO poker. Modern Poker Theory and PokerCoaching.com. Actually, go to PokerCoaching.com slash lucky. It'll save you some money. Also, we're giving away $1,500, $500 to the winner, $100 to 10 other people at pokercoaching.com slash giveaway. <sighs> Let's see. But yes, you should knock out people. You're in a downswing. Sometimes you lose when you, um, when you run into big hands. That's part of life. That's why I have to play a lot of volume. Will poker rooms increase rake once they reopen? Ooh, I don't know. It's a good question. They always increase rake over time. Mark, good morning. 100 big blinds effective. Hijack opens with three big blinds, button flats, heroes in the small blind with five. Standard to set mine or three is three betting an option? No, I always flat call there. Maximilian, you're welcome. That's a cool name. Humanity has at least a few more years. They definitely have a few more years. And like, I don't think a virus is probably going to wipe out every human on the earth because there are lots of humans who have literally no contact with other humans, like you know, various tribal groups, right? They will probably not get any of these things. Like Hawaii right now, right? I don't think Hawaii has any cases. And even then, people, I think we can still fly to Hawaii. Um, how'd you learn to crush super late stage? I played a ton of sit and goes and got good at final tables. All right. Regards from Argentina. Hello. You're studying with a buddy when you finish it. You always see and take notes. Well, good. I'm glad to hear you're taking notes and improving your skills. This is exactly what we are going for. What books do I recommend? Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. Here we go. This is actually what you need. If you are new to poker, don't really know what you're doing, this book will teach you about range analysis, which is highly important. You think learning GTO is essential. Look, again, people don't really realize what learn GTO even means. The best players in the world play nowhere near GTO. So is it essential? No, it's not essential. Useful. Not essential. Because at the end of the day, you beat most people by maximally exploiting your opponents. Did I announce my new coach? No, I didn't. And I actually need to get on that because I haven't heard from him in a little while. Recently, we did add Faraz Jaka. We added Jonathan Jaffe. We added Lexi Gavin. And we have one more coach who hasn't made me any content yet. But he said he would. So we'll see. Spoiler alert, he was, at, uh, he was at the table in my most recent video blog at the dinner at Picasso. 
and he's probably the best poker player of the group. <laughs> Some of them may take offense at that. All right. What's the highest rate you'll accept to play against good players? Not a lot. I mean, I just won't even play against good players. If I think they're good, I don't expect to have an edge, right? So I'm not going to even spend my time playing against all good players. What's the most important aspect to eat small stakes games? Maximally exploit your opponent. Take advantage of whatever they do incorrectly. All right. 600 big blinds deep, okay? 600 BB? Oh, I said, okay, I see. So we're playing 20 big blinds deep. You're in the small blind. Undergun makes it 1,500 small blind flats. You jam. Is this too a little too loose? I don't see your cards, TJ. If you don't tell me your cards, I can't tell you. But um, depends on your opponent's range entirely, right? This is purely a math problem. We discussed this thoroughly in this book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, right? How to play shallow stacked. Reshoving strategy. If you're going to get called a lot, you can't jam with much of anything. If you're going to get called a ton, you can. I'm sorry. If you're going to get called a ton, you can shove... Or if you're going to get called a ton, you should shove pretty tight. If you're going to get called very rarely, you can shove a ton. What's the best way to study hands? Figure out what you do wrong. Discuss them with friends. Run them through solvers, right? Do things like that. I keep skipping your question. Well, type it one more time and I promise I won't miss it. <laughs> I think. I think I won't miss it. What's the most important thing to know when playing turbo, micro stakes sit and goes with a rebuy. I don't know, man. Learn the structure. Learn to play according to the specific structure that you are playing. Man, oh man, this has quickly turned into a question and answer. We were talking about equity realization today. How do we get so sidetracked? What is Nightbot? Nightbot is a bot on Twitch that will randomly say things like, um, Check me out on YouTube. <laughs> All right, TJ, I think you typed the same question. I think you still didn't type it in your hand. I mean, come on, everyone. What's the proper bankroll for someone with a disability collecting benefits? The fact that you're on disability collecting benefits should not really matter. What matters is, do you plan on playing as if you are never going to go broke, right? Like, are you, is going broke detrimental or is it not? Are you saying that you're on, you're collecting benefits and you can consistently replenish your bankroll? Or are you saying, I, I don't understand the purpose of you telling me that you're collecting benefits. That's like saying you have a job or something, right? Um, so are you saying that you are okay losing some money, right? Also, you're not even telling me what game you're playing, Andrew. The game you're playing is very, very valuable. How many hours do you play poker each week? Either none or 80. All right, TJ, you're at A-Strike suited. Um, I'd probably flat call against early position raise. Desperately trying to get a ticket to a tournament. Why? Don't try to get a lottery ticket. Instead, try to get good and just learn to make money from poker consistently. Working brush upon your PLO8 tips. Oh, I have no idea. I don't know a single thing about PLO8. What solvers do I recommend to new players? None of them. Absolutely none of them. Go to pokercoaching.com, sign up. We have videos on all the common spots you will encounter so that you don't have to worry about buying a solver for $1,000 and renting a server for $1,000 a month and running solutions for three months. We're actually in the process of solving a few spots. We're going to make a very, very good preflop app that's going to blow all the other ones out of the water. And... Um, we're, we're running solutions. It's going to cost us 5000 bucks and take two months. But, I mean, that, that that's what solver work is, is. Sometimes it takes a ton of time. King 8 offsuit in the small blind. Middle position min raises. Fold skew. Just fold. Easy fold. Easy, 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 easy fold. Easy, easy fold. Big blind fold. Slop comes 8-2-2. Two, two. You bet. I would never lead. You do not have the range advantage here, and you do not have the nut advantage here. This is definitely a spot to check 100% of your range. You lead, he calls, turns another eight, you check. I would just definitely keep betting. If the guy's ace high, is not going to fold. He checks, rivers and eights. You bet, he raises pot. What would I do? I would call. No point in re-raising, because he's only going to call it off of pocket aces, you would think. You sort of like this telecommuting thing. Um, you're going to find that you can be way more productive from home than you came from an office place for most jobs. <clears throat> You've asked 20 Twitch players, none of them know PLO8. Well, I'll tell you why. It's important to realize that you want to play a game and devote significant time of your life to a game that has a future, assuming you are playing poker to make money. And 
you know, maybe you play in a place where they do have 10, 20, and 25, 50, and 50, 100 by, um, blind PLO8 games. But whenever I see a PLO8 game, it's almost always tiny stakes or almost always part of a mixed game. And that is just not worth devoting five years of your life to to get good at a game that doesn't really have much of a future beyond the small stakes, which is why, you know, I think singles are a great game and they're good practice, but they're not a good way to make money long term. And I'm trying to teach all of you to make money long term. It makes sense for you to learn PLO8 now because there are guys with 30% ROI and the No Limit Hold'em Crushers have like 7% ROI. You're missing a big point here, your blow. What are you missing? What determines how much you make? How much will that app cost? I'm sure it'll be free for Poker Coaching Premium members, Mark. Don't worry. That's going to take time, though. We, it's, it's, we're down the road. You blow. So look, whenever you're looking at how much money you can make, ROI is not the most important concern. It is important, but volume is highly important. I met a guy a long time ago who was the biggest winner in PLO sit and goes. He was bragging about his 40% ROI. He was crushing it. Then I started looking it up and I'm like, you get to play three games per day at the biggest buy-in being $30. So you're making like, what? You make 15 bucks a game, making $45 a day. Whereas you could play 200 or $2,000 buy-in sit and goes and make 2% ROI or 5% ROI or 10% ROI, right? And... You can play as many as you want. You can play 200 a day, right? You just make way more money if you can put in volume. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. Just a high ROI is not all you need. Is there a reason you don't raise low pocket pairs? Because they flop poorly, meaning you're usually gonna have just like a hand that has little potential to improve from out of position. Why should you buy my course over BBZ? You have 150 bucks. Um, his costs 500 bucks a month. That's why. He is more elite player than you. Maybe, maybe. Feel free. Go see whose content you like more. Fortunately, I'm in this position in life where I don't really have to work too hard to sell my product. It sells itself. And um, you try it, you like it. Also, sign up for mine. If you don't like it, cancel and I'll give you a refund. If you tell me you don't learn anything and you think that it was useless. If I don't help you get better at poker, I don't deserve your money. This is very different than most people who charge a ton of money and they won't give you a refund, and they won't give you attention. So you have to figure out what you're trying to accomplish. There are lots of training videos out there. There's very little actual hands-on educational content. When you play 80 hours a week live, what games are you playing? Live tournaments. Kings in the big blind, folds the small blind, she raises. You three bet half pot. All right. Fuck, it was king six two. You shoved. I would definitely not shove. Did you play it wrong? Yeah, definitely don't shove the flop. I don't even know how many chips you have, but you definitely shouldn't shove the flop because you're going to make your opponent play well. You have to remember volume. Yeah, volume's important. Is donk betting a new thing? I mean, it's always existed. It's still not a great play. You should typically lead, though, when you have the range advantage and or equity advantage. B Flanagan, this is horrible logic. Horrible logic. If anything, you want to be tighter when we're deep stacked. We discussed this at the top of the show. Please go back and rewatch the show. Man, oh man, I'm lacking patience today. Can you all tell I'm lacking patience? I think it's because I'm tired. Um, we were talking about equity realization here. We said at the top of the show, when you're out of position, you realize equity poorly. When you're deep stacked, you realize equity poorly as the caller, especially with hands like big card, little card. Those are exactly the hands you don't want to play because you're going to be crushed. Please answer Henderson's question. Let's see. How do you learn to study who has the range advantage? Just run it through Equilab. How do you study learn this so you can know when you can bet when your opponent usually misses? It's easy to say, well, here it is. Look, I'll show you, right? What you do, put a range in. Here we have this range. I don't even know what this range is. This is 33% uh, of hands. Let's say this is middle position range. And let's say you're going to call the big blind with um, who knows what it actually is. Anderson, sorry you're watching this on Instagram. You can't see this. Um, say you're going to call the big blind with all sorts of junk, right? Basically, I'm giving you a wide range. It doesn't even matter what it is, right? So let's put in a board of um, seven of spades, six of spades, five of clubs. This is a board where you should know the preflop raiser is not going to have much of an advantage at all. Looking at it right now, it's 50-50. So this is a spot where both, well, the big blind should be, or the out of position player should be checking a lot because they don't have an advantage. And position player should be checking a lot because they don't have an advantage. So 
realize that board is better for one player's range than the other. Let's say instead it's ace of spades, queen of clubs, ten of diamonds. Well, now preflop raiser has 60% equity, 59% equity, right? Sorry, this is off the screen again for everyone. Um, how do you do this? You get in there and you run the situations over and over and over and over and over. Every time you're in a spot, run it. Run it and, and solve it. Solve the problem. You're in a funk. How do you get back into it? Play a lot and study a lot. Especially if you're playing tournaments, realize you're going to have lots of variants. Let's see. Is it worth studying PLO to play one hand per orbit you play? Um, probably. Any tips on becoming more skilled multi-tabling? Start adding in a lot of um, start adding in a lot of tables at tiny, tiny, tiny stakes, and then get a lot of experience. Practice a lot. Um, more elite player John Lilla has won millions at poker. I have indeed, but um, I know I know I don't know the BBZ guy personally, but he runs a stable that I think is successful. He seems to play well from the content I've seen. So I mean, I'm sure he's a very, very strong player. He's been around for forever. He probably is a better player than me. Um, and that's that's important to realize that you are not always the best and also not to have an ego associated with poker, right? That said, I don't think it's the best idea necessarily to learn from players who play the very high stakes specifically online, especially if you are trying to play small stakes live poker or small stakes online poker, right? Um, however, you know, the guy runs the stable. I'm sure he's good. So if you want to pay 500 bucks a month for his training video, so then, you know, there you go. Price is a big consideration because I'll give you a refund if you don't like it. And um, you can sign up for $10, $8 a month. So try to pay $8 a month and get solid educational content or $500 a month. Figure that one out. You always recommend a pot size raise. No. When you're deep stacked, quite often. When you're not deep stacked, not so much. All right, all right, all right. Just play Ace 2 a lot. Kevin basically solved PLO 8 for you. All right, all right, all right, all right. 5K bankroll, what stakes do you play? Depends on what game you're going to play. Read jonathanlillpoker.com slash bankroll. Is it wise to mix up teachings? Sure. Depends on your goal, right? I mean, you need to sit back and you need to ask, what am I trying to accomplish here? And, you know, raise your edge is just like, I don't know, 10 hours of content. So, I mean... 1500 bucks for 10 hours of content. I mean, it is what it is. It's good content. It's high level. Problem is, it's difficult to implement for the vast majority of people who are not already pretty strong players. But again, it's one of those things that's very expensive right off the get. And, um, you know, that's for some people. It's not for everyone. They actually have an interesting pricing model, which may actually be smart, where they charge very little initially and then they charge more as more people sign up. I just try to make it accessible to people. I'm not trying to vague people. Um, which tournaments do you recommend? Which tournaments do you recommend to play during the virus if you're a live player? Well, none of them in live poker, but I would tell you to start off playing tiny stakes online because you're probably not a winning online player if you've never played online poker. So start off tiny. When you check with your medium strength hands on the river, it's for equity realization, isn't it? Well, no, that's not the purpose. You're checking because you don't have the range or the nut advantage. First month of premium, you're binging videos. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. I take pride in seeing other people suffer. You're a millionaire and you still want money from people. Hmm, well, believe it or not, we spend um, mid five figures a month on content in the team. Think about this. If I'm spending literally $50,000 a month, maybe more, depending on the month, on content my employees, to help make content for you, do you think I should be able to recuperate $50,000 a month? Imagine I gave it all away for free. I would only be able to last if I wanted to spend a million dollars for 20 months. Do you think I really should just decide to lose all of my money over the next 20 months and then not have any money to play poker, to support my family, to keep my employees around? Does that make logical sense? I think a lot of people don't understand the amount of money that goes into what I do. And uh, we have to recuperate some of it. On good months, we recuperate all of it. Bad months, uh, maybe not. 
So anyway, that's that. Eight dollars a month. What did you miss? Um, check out PokerCoaching.com/lucky. If you sign up for Poker Coaching, the regular membership, it is, I believe, three hundred dollars for three years. I think I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Three hundred dollars for three years. Um, it's like eight bucks a month, right? I think. I think that's right. Maybe nine bucks a month. I don't know. Not very good at math. When you win a big tournament, you'll send me a pizza. <laughs> People just trolling to get some excitement in their life. Ooh, we got to get excited. We have to show Jonathan Little that we don't understand business at all. Yeah, it's tough because I, I realize a lot of people think that all of this stuff is free. They think it's literally me sitting in my office with nothing to do all day. Believe it or not, I have a family. I have a wife and two kids who I like spending my time with. I have um, rent. We have to, well, it's not rent. We have a mortgage. We have to pay mortgage each month. We have expenses. I think a lot of people just don't get the expenses, right? They see streamers who are like individual people who've been doing this for six months and think, oh, the guy's just like sitting around playing some cards all day. He has no expenses. And to be fair, he doesn't have many expenses. He still has some, right? Somebody has to get this microphone. They have to get a computer. They have to get a camera. But we've actually been doing this about 15 years and we have a team. We have six, seven employees, we have a bunch of content creators. Stuff's not cheap. You'll sign up today. Yeah, sign up today. It's completely free to get a trial membership where you can check it out. How much money do you own to your name? I think in theory the answer is none because I'm married, right? My wife and I file jointly. So I, I think, I'm not sure how that works. What kind of content do you have for late stage tournament play? All of it. Go to pokercoaching.com and check it out. People think that since you have a lot of money, you should be happy to spend it all, along with your time on strangers with no return on investment. Makes sense? Yeah, that does make sense. That does make logical sense. <laughs> um, I mean, to be fair, I give away money all the time, right? We're giving away 1500 bucks this month. Go to pokercoaching.com slash giveaway. We're giving away $500 to the grand prize winner and then $100 to 10 other people. Can I take you seriously for a moment? As soon as you can put question marks at the end of your sentences, I will take you seriously. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You guys caught me on a cranky day. You missed the video with God's Big Toes. It on YouTube. Yes, Brian, it's on YouTube. Click on the video tab. Right click on it. Open it in a new window. It'll be right up there at the top. Would you say you've lost the love of the game? No. Why would you think I've lost the love of the game? You see me sitting here all day, every day for all of you. Do you think that means I don't love the game? Would you say it's a big no-no to try to get players off top pair? Yes. Don't try to make players full top pair. I love poker. I like going to play cards. Um... I'm sure I don't love it as much as when I was new to the game and didn't know anything about poker, right? Because then you're like excited, you're gambling. I don't get excited when I play, but I like going to play. I love studying the game. I love working for all of you to help all of you make to make you, all of you better at the game. How big of a sample in tournaments do you need to know how well you're doing? It depends on how many people are in the tournament, right? Also depends on your ROI. Like if you're playing 100 person tournaments and you have 300% ROI, over 500 games, I mean, you're just a good player, right? But if you have 20% ROI over 500 games, you could easily be a losing player. Has Faraz released content? He has. Only 57 likes. Yeah, well, people don't like my content sometimes. Like I said, you all caught me on a cranky day. Every once in a while, Jay Little wakes up a little bit cranky. <laughs> Uh, for all those quizzes, he also has um, some classes somewhere. Let me see. Oh, you see my email server there? That's nice. All right. PokerCoaching.com. Let's go website. Classes. Click on the Classes tab. Internet's going slow because I'm streaming. Click on... Hmm, probably coaching webinars or my classes, one of the two. Let's see. Here we go. Exploitative plays to crush live poker tournaments. Part two with Faraz Jaka released a few day, released a few days ago, which means part one is somewhere here. Yeah, so Faraz Jaka already has um, multiple, multiple webinars available for the poker coaching premium members. So check that out. If you understand it right, 1,200 tournaments with an ROI of 350 cent isn't pretty good, right? No, 350% is very good. But you have to ask where did it come from, right? Did it come from just like one big score or did it come from lots of little scores, right? Lots of little scores 
assuming they're like wins in first and second and third places, is way more indicative of skill than if you played like the Sunday Million 50 times and you won it once and now you have 500% ROI, right? Is Bovada different from Ignition? I think they're the same thing. All right. You're better, says Dino. Okay, thank you. Faraz is an OG. You know, funny enough, there are a lot of people who are OGs. I think that means original grinders who've been around for a very long time and they're still crushing it. There are a lot of people who started a long time ago who failed. A lot of them. A lot of them. But some of us stay around and we still show up and we still make good work. We still win poker tournaments, right? And Faraz is one of those. Jonathan Jaffe is one of those, right? These are two guys who I respect immensely and I hire them to make content because I want to learn from them because they always give me a whole lot of trouble when I'm playing. Vincent says, very kind words. You guys should try Poker Coaching Premium. The amount of high quality content is amazing. It is. And we are continuously working to improve the website. I realize it's not organized the most cleanly at the moment, but we are fixing that. We're doing a lot of work. Like I said, we're spending loads of money each month for you. Literally lighting it on fire. Employing people, even in the downswing. We have laid off no people. <laughs> and um, we're, we're continuing to do the work. Is there really an online poker pro? Yes, online poker players do exist. Do your coaches go over recent hand reviews? Some of them do. They do a mix of content. Sometimes they go over students' hands. Sometimes they present classes. How do you submit a hand to be reviewed? Send an email support at pokercoaching.com. I know Matt Affleck does student reviews on a pretty regular basis. Well, I get a seat at Phil Helmuth's home game. I played in Phil Helmuth's home game one time. It was a lot of fun. I don't know if they're going to let me back or not. Is there a certain number of hands to know whether or not you're winning? No. As you play more hands, you get a better idea, right? As, like say you play a billion hands, you know if you're a winner, winning player or not. If you played 100 hands, you have no clue. As you have got get closer to a billion, you'll have a better idea, right? But is there a specific number? Not really. I mean, there are good players who break even over 100,000 hands and if they don't have a big win rate, right? So... I don't know, I, like 100,000 hands is probably a pretty good number to have a decent idea. That said, variance still happens. Will I be doing any coaching for profits program? Coaching people in exchange for the percentage of their winnings? Probably not. And um, there are many reasons for that. Main reason is people can screw you. I prefer not having the option for people to screw me. I want to make sure that if people screw me, it is for exactly one month of poker coaching that I give them a refund for. Did I smash the Phil Helmuth home game? I think I actually broke even. I want to, I lost a big flip right at the end. I was up like 20K and then I lost a big flip very near the end of the session. What are my thoughts on short deck? Probably will not survive long term. If it does survive long term, it'll be a game like PLO, which means it's probably not worth devoting your life to. It'll be fine, though. I mean, I don't know. Can, do you get to play a game on a regular basis? That's really the question. Do you get to play regularly for high stakes? And if the answer is yes, then it might be okay. What does Phil Helmuth do right? Phil Helmuth is the best at getting players to do what he wants them to do. Have I played a lot against Helmuth? I have. He's actually done quite well against me, which is annoying to say. But it's true. I worked with Phil Helmuth some. I co-wrote a book with him, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. Oh, we got this too. I got him his book deal. I published this book for him, The Poker Brat. He has a biography. Also, is everything falling over back there? Please don't fall over everything back there. Also, here he is. We wrote Excelling at No Limit Hold'em with him. You all see this? And a bunch of other people. It's good to work well with others. Phil Helmuth had a section in that on um, short stack play. Him and Liv Bory compared new school short stack strategies to old school short stack strategies. It was actually a good chapter. Phil Helmuth told me he wanted to write on short stack play. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, it was a good chapter. I remember I was playing deep in a $5,000 tournament one time with Phil Helmuth, and he min raised under the gun, and I like jammed 12 big blinds. I think I had aces, like literal aces. Gets back around to him and he like folded pocket nines or something absurd. I'm like, are you kidding me? 
Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, that was fun. I think he actually like took fifth place in the tournament or something too. I do remember he got it in all, all in on the next hand with like five three against uh, King Jack and he spiked. So you know, got to run a little bit hot. All right, I have to go now. I hope you all have a great day. I hope you all enjoy yourselves. Again, check out pokercoaching.com slash lucky if you want to support me and my habit of spending tons of money to help all of you get better at poker. If you don't want to support my habit of that, well, that's okay. Um, if you want to ha enter the giveaway where I'm just giving away some money because, you know, I like giving away money too. I like spending money on poker coaching content for all of you and I like giving away money. Um, check that out at pokercoaching.com slash giveaway. I realize we are in tough times. I realize that life is hectic. I realize um, we're in an interesting world. Please know that I will do my best to be a constant for all of you. I'll do my best to be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like I said, um, we don't have our nanny to watch the kids anymore. So um, there may have to be days where I take it off, but we're all home for the foreseeable future and we're in this together. So I'll see you all again on Friday. Also check out um, youtube.com slash poker coaching. I've been adding a lot of pretty cool content. I did a hand history review just the other day where I reviewed uh, God's Big Toe, a poker streamer's hand history from a deep run in a World Series uh, ring event online. Also, I interviewed my lawyer, Mac Verstandig, on the legality of poker within America. And um, today, later, I'm going to be recording an interview with the co-author of Rounders, the iconic poker movie. Brian Koppelman, and um, that'll be up on YouTube over the next few days. So anyway, I'm making a lot of content for you. I realize that all of you are stuck at home, or many of you are stuck at home, and that's that. Well, I see you. Oh, do you mean Monday? Is today Friday? I don't even know what day I said. You have to realize, whenever I'm streaming, I don't even know what words I'm saying. <laughs> yes, Monday. I'll be back Monday, bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you all very much for being here. Click like, click subscribe, share this with your friends. I'll talk to you next time.